historian and Mongol vizier Rashid al-Din wrote about Mongolian women in his monumental book called Compendium of Chronicles in the 14th century. He had to apologize to his readers because he was departing from the norms of the Islamic society at the time, which left women unmentioned, and he discussed the lively participation of the wives of the great Mongol Ilhams in the highest Mongol council, Hurubak, and he justified his departure by saying that Mongols accord their women equal treatment. Indian Mongolian women have traditionally enjoyed more economic and political freedom than women in agricultural societies. And that's because uh, that's largely due to our pastoral nomadic culture, and that's because we women uh, fulfill essential roles in all aspects of subsistence and household. And the gender division of labor is not very rigid. It's often said that Mongolian women perform women's duties inside the home and men's duties outside the home. And as a testament to that freedom and power, our history is rich with great and wise queens who ruled over vast territories and commanded armies, such as Sokhothani Bek, Mandohai the Wise, and Queen Anu. <coughs> so, today, there's a perception among Mongolians that Mongolian women are highly accomplished, powerful, and thus better off than women in most parts of the world. There's also a perception that mothers are highly revered in Mongolia. But is that the reality? So today I'd like to talk about the space between perception and reality for Mongolian women. And at first glance, there seems to be enough evidence to support these perceptions. We sing more about our mothers than our fathers. Um, when we went through Mongolian songbooks, we found about seven songs about mother for every song about father. In all those songs, uh, they talk about children's love and respect for their mothers and deep appreciation for the care received. And like most of you, I grew up hearing stories and sayings about how indebted we are to our mothers. And one of them says, even if you collect enough morning dew to make tea for your mother, you would still only repay one night's worth of care she gave you as a child. And as for accomplishment, Mongolian women are doing better than women in lower middle income countries in many areas, such as tertiary enrollment, uh, maternal mortality, etc. But we often tend to think in isolation, and we don't always put things in perspective. For example, the modern appearance that we think is unique to Mongolia is actually observed in other cultures as well. Recent studies show that reverence for mothers is more prevalent in Latino culture and Asian culture than Euro-American culture. In fact, there are many Chinese songs that express giving back to parents, and there are more Chinese songs about mothers than fathers. Moreover, we're not the only pastoral nomads in the world. Um, of the estimated 30 to 40 million pastoral nomads, most of them are found in Central Asia, and Africa, in countries such as Mauritania and Afghanistan. So it's not a stretch to think that mother reverence could be just as high in those countries as well. So three of us, uh, all Mongolian academics in the U.S., doctors Okunstik and Tumunasung at Bentley University, and myself at Loyola University of Maryland, we wanted to see how Mongolian women were doing compared to the rest of the world. So let's look at some indicators using some benchmarks. We're going to compare numbers for Mongolia with numbers um, for low and middle income countries because we're classified as one and also uh, against other countries with significant nomadic heritage such as Afghanistan, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, etc. And also high income countries and other East Asia and Pacific countries. Okay? So let's look at some indicators. When you look at economic participation indicator, uh, women's labor force participation, what you see is that Mongolia is doing better than other lower middle income countries and also nomadic countries and getting quite close to the high income country levels. And if you look at ratio of female to male labor participation, actually the ratio of Mongolia is higher than high income countries. And if you look at uh, educational attainment and if you look at 
enrollment of women in higher education, what you see is that Mongolia is doing far better than other lower middle income countries and nomadic countries, and getting quite close to high income country levels. And if you look at ratio of female to male uh, higher education enrollment, as you can see, the ratio for Mongolia is actually higher than that of higher income countries. And if you look at a measure of health and survival, uh, women's life expectancy, you see that Mongolian women are doing slightly better than lower middle income country women and also women in nomadic, nomadic heritage countries, but still less behind high income countries. And However, if you look at female to male life expectancy, what you see is that the ratio for Mongolia is the highest in this figure, so higher than our benchmarks. So far, all numbers look good for Mongolian women, right? Um, but if you look at political empowerment measures of women, that's when numbers start looking bad for Mongolian women. If you look at proportion of seats held by women in national parliament, what you see is that Mongolia fares much worse than our benchmarks. And these are 2011 numbers. And we know that with the recent election in 2012, we got several more female parliament members. But we're still behind our benchmarks. And we're not just behind uh, high-income countries or Scandinavian countries. As mentioned in one of the talks earlier today, for example, in Rwanda, 56% of the women, uh, sorry, 56% of the uh, lower house parliament members are women. In Mozambique, 40% of the parliament members are women. And when you look at high-level uh, high government jobs, the numbers are disappointing as well. As you can see, when you go up the ladder, the percentage of women in those jobs just shrinks. Of leading officers, or so-called Hirmun Tushmut in Mongolian, only 7% of them are women. And when you look at female representation at regional and district level governments, uh, we do poorly as well, as you can see from these figures. We never had a female president or female prime minister. And when you look at female rep women's representation, the leadership of business and professional jobs, the numbers aren't good either. In Mongolia, there are 56,000 business entities, and many of them are owned and run by women. But when you move up the ladder to Mongolian Stock Exchange top 20 companies, only 10% of them have female CEOs, and only about 20% of the boards have female members. And if you look at other professions, uh, the numbers aren't great either. Uh, if you look at physicians, in Mongolia, 80% of all physicians are women. But when you look at large hospitals and clinics, only about 20% of them are headed by women. Same thing with higher education. About 70% of, of all teachers in higher education are women, but when you look at large universities, only about 10% of them are headed by women. So these numbers show that Mongolian women are falling behind in political in decision making, especially in political decision making. But this trend of women falling behind in political decision making doesn't seem to be unique to Mongolia. There is a gender gap index by the World Economic Forum, which measures gender-based gaps in access to resources and opportunities. So this index is not about the level of development of that country, because that can be different from one country to another. It's not about the level of uh, resources and opportunities in that country, but it's about gap between men and women in access to those resources. So in an ideal world, you would have all these four corners filled. These four corners represent four components of the index. So in an ideal world, all these corners would be filled, meaning that there is absolute equality between men and women in these four aspects. And when you look across 135 countries, over 90% of the world population, what you see is that almost 96% of the gap between men and women in health outcomes, almost 93% of the gap in educational attainment between men and women have been closed. So that's good. If you look at economic participation, 
about 60% of the gap between men and women has been closed. But in political empowerment, only about 20% of the gap has been closed. And this is how Mongolia looks like. And as you can see, Mongolian women have caught up a lot in, on education and in health. But so have the women in other countries. And you see that Mongolia, um, the women, the equality that women enjoy in economic participation is higher than the world average, but uh, they do much worse than, um, than the world in terms of political empowerment. In fact, this gap between economic situation of women and the political situation of the woman is nowhere else is this gap as pronounced as it is in Mongolia. So according to this index, Mongolia ranks number one in the world in terms of gender gap in economic participation. But we rank 127th out of 135 countries in terms of political empowerment. So that's a huge gap. And if you actually look at this gap, what many of you may not know, um, I don't know what happened to the bottom, but <laughs> it's supposed to show that Mongolia ranks number one in the world in terms of the gap between economic and political equality. And the blue line is the world average, and the red line is Mongolia. So we rank number one in the world in terms of the gap between economic equality of women and political equality of women. And if you look at 10 other countries um, that were ranked, uh, that were ranked, if you look at the other countries that were ranked lowest, along with Mongolia, in terms of political empowerment, what you see from this list is, perhaps apart from Belize, which is an island nation with about 300,000 people, all the other countries are Muslim-majority countries. And if you look at other countries that have similar indicators for women as Mongolia, you see that they all have much better female representation at national level. So for example, if you look at 10 countries with the same higher education enrollment with a woman, which is the first bar, they on average have um, parliaments where 26% uh, where of the parliament members are women. And we're far behind that. And when you look at other measures, such as uh, Women's uh, Economic uh, Opportunity Index, they all tell a similar story. So yes, Mongolian women are doing better than women in other similar income countries, but we're doing worse than our peers with same education and same economic participation. And when we were looking at data, another surpri um, surprising and unique thing about Mongolia that we found was this pronounced gender gap that exists in many areas in Mongolia. And we have to think about what that means. For example, in life expectancy, the difference between male and female life expectancy in the world is about four years. And it's about 3.5 years for lower middle income countries. But that number for Mongolia is eight, which makes Mongolia one of the countries with the highest gender gap in life expectancy in the world. Same thing with higher education enrollment we have one of the highest female to male higher education enrollment in the world. Last year, 22,900 women graduated from universities and colleges in Mongolia versus 12,900 men. And when you look at marriage data, our population survey shows that of Mongolian women who have undergraduate degree, half of them were married to men with sim similar education level as themselves, which is what you would expect. But the other half were almost entirely married to men with lower education than themselves. And only 3.2% of Mongolian women with undergraduate degree were married to men with higher education than themselves. So these numbers show that women are doing better in health and education, but still not at positions of power. So all of these numbers essentially show that Mongolian women are not doing well for the level of educational 
um, educational and economic participation um, they have. Uh, in fact, there's a serious gender inequity when it comes to decision-making levels, which needs to be rectified. And when you look at other countries with similar indicators for Mongolia, uh, such as these uh, 10 countries with same female literacy rate, 10 countries with similar female labor market participation, as you see, all of them have higher GDP per capita and higher female representation at national government. So this means there's a great potential for us, but how do we reach the potential? We're at the fork on the road. Well, we first need more women at positions of power, and our recent move towards the requirement, minimum requirement of 20% of parliament candidates to be women is a step in the right direction, but more needs to be done. We need, we need to start imposing and enforcing quotas, not only for parliament memberships, but also for board memberships and important government jobs. Across the world, about half, of, about half of the countries across the world have recently introduced quotas to increase female represent, representation in politics. So, whether, whether the legacy of these great and wise queens continues, is up to us. If Rwanda and Mozambique can challenge Scandinavian countries on female representation in politics, why can't we? Thank you.